the theme for today's message is invest in your spiritual life. Now as we'll see a little bit later on in this passage, the church of Laodicea was very wealthy. In fact, the entire city of Laodicea was very wealthy. An interesting anecdote or history, historical story uh, from their history is that in 60 AD, about two to three decades before this letter was written, the city of Laodicea had an earthquake that pretty much destroyed the city. Now this happened to many cities in that general area, where we talked about that in previous cities, that uh, various different cities had that same issue with earthquakes. But unlike the other cities that requested help from Imperial Rome to rebuild because they didn't have the finances, Laodicea was actually able to rebuild their own city from their own personal wealth. They were a very, very wealthy city. And as we go pa through this passage, we will see that physical wealth by itself means nothing to the Lord. And sometimes we put great stock in physical wealth. We say physical wealth is the thing that we need. And yet the Lord will show us that it means nothing before Him. Instead, the Lord is interested in our spiritual wealth, not our physical wealth. Again, as we go through this passage, the theme is invest in your spiritual life. <clears throat> so let's start reading. I will have Ivy on my right hand here. Start and then we'll go around this way. Since last time we went around that way. I'll give you guys a break. <laughs> this time we'll go around this way. So let's read verses 14 through 22. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful, true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this. I know your words that you are neither called nor had, and to be sure that you were called or had. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have, and have need of nothing, and do not know what you are, rich, miserable, poor, blind, and sick. I counsel you to buy me, to buy from me gold the fire and the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be gold. But the shade of your nakedness may not be revealed, and the light your eyes with eyes out the you see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me at my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with the Father in his throne. He was the ear that will hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <clears throat> so, obviously a very powerful message, a very potent message to the church at Laodicea. Uh, and a very rebuking message and just like with all the other churches we should take an introspective look in our lives and say is this something that is applicable to our lives uh, and to our ministry situation I pray it doesn't but we should always consider it so that if it's true we could allow the Lord to change our hearts so first of all, we start off with the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ and of course the identity of the church. So the, it's to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, as we've already talked about briefly, the, the uh, church of Laodicea and their city. Uh, one other thing I could mention, which we'll get to it later, is that they were also, uh, the main reason why they're rich is because they produced a lot of clothing. So they were a clothing supplier. And so to the church of Laodiceans, write and say, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, and the beginning of the creation of God. Now here we have the identity of Jesus Christ. Of course, he is many things, but to each church he presents himself just a little bit differently according to who he is that in a way that speaks to their specific situation. So how does this description of Jesus speak to their situation. Of course, we know that 
as we look at the church of Laodicea, they're a church that's very materialistic, and they're a church that Jesus is ca calling to move away from their materialism and invest in their spiritual life. And so notice how he says these things. These things says the Amen. Jesus is the Amen. Amen. <laughs> Now, usually the word amen in the Bible is not used the way we would say it. We, after a prayer, we say amen, right? Or sometimes in English, uh, so let it be, something like that. But the word amen in Greek is usually used to express the idea of this, the truth of the statement. Whenever you read in the scriptures where Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you, or verily, verily, in some translations, that's amen, amen, lego huimen, truly, truly, I say to you. Amen, amen. It's like uh, usually he uses it in double, sometimes single, but sometimes double to express the tinaudness or the trueness of what he is saying to the people. This thing is really true what I'm saying to you. Jesus is the true. He is the amen. These things says he who is the amen. He is the truth. We've heard that in different places in the scriptures, especially Jesus speaking to Pontius Pilate. Whoever hears my voice, whoever wants to hear the truth, listens to my voice. Jesus is the truth. Now, why would that be significant for what he's going to say to the Laodiceans? What do you guys think? How is that significant? They're struggling with materialism. They're rich, physically, poor, spiritually. How does this relate to them? What do you guys think? It's significant for that Jesus is everything and more important than material things. So yeah? He, he's challenging them to be different. He's challenging them to be different. And then with that, they have to trust that what he's telling that he is true. <laughs> you know, that's always the, the difficulty when you're challenged to go into a different, something different, right? Jesus is calling you out of this and into this. You've got to trust that he's true. Because if he's not true, then you shouldn't change. But if he is true, then you should definitely change. <laughs> you should definitely go into what he is calling you to be. The Lord's calling them to go from materialism to invest in their life spiritually. And they've got to trust that he's the amen, that he's true. Not only is he true, but of course, what does being true lead to? It leads to someone who tells you what is true. So what Jesus says, his witness to them is faithful and it's true. And so just as he is true, also what he is going to say to them is true. And so he's saying, trust me, trust me what I'm going to say to you. Now, in their perspective, as we'll see later on, they think they're fine. They don't see any issue in their life right now. If you would ask them before they got this letter, if you give them a survey, spiritual survey, how do you think you're doing on a scale of one to 10? Oh, I'm great, you know, perfect. You know, life is great, no problem. That's probably how they would say their life is if you gave them a survey before they got this letter from Jesus. So they've got to be able to trust what Jesus says is accurate because Jesus is telling them your whole life is upside down. But not only that, he is also, thirdly, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, we're not talking about Jesus being the first created thing. The, the Greek word there literally is arche, which, uh, you know, maybe in the English beginning might have you, several meanings or whatnot. But for the idea of arche, or translated here in many other places, beginning, it's the idea of origin. Jesus is the origin of the creation of God, which we know that in the book of John, when uh, you talk, it talks about the word being with God and then the word through the word, all things were created and there was nothing that was created that, you know, was not created through the word. Also in Colossians, we see that Jesus created all things. Of course, we, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but he did that through Jesus Christ or same person, the Trinity, who is called the word. And so we see here that Jesus is the origin of the creation of God. Now, why is that significant for their situation? What are they dealing with? What's their issue again? They're dealing with materialism. So it 
stands to figure that the one who created all things material would know the best use for those material things and what material things can and cannot do. Sometimes, and this is true for all human beings, wherever we live, whether it be in the Philippines or the US, we think material solutions can solve all problems in our lives. As long as I have more money, as long as I have a better job, as long as I have, you know, this much in my bank account, or this nice of a house, or this kind of transportation or whatnot, then, then I'll be fine. But later on, if you, if you get those things, if that's what you're seeking for, and you get those things, they won't satisfy. Now, it doesn't mean that those things are wrong, they're not evil, but it's all about what, what is your heart's desire? Where is your heart's desire? And if your heart's desire is on material things, well, as we'll see here, the Church of Laodicea had all kinds of material things, and yet they spiritually were destitute. Jesus is the origin of the creation of God. He created all things material. He is going to be the one to call them from materialism and say, invest in your spiritual life. Now again, I'm not saying that to have material things is evil by itself. I know quite a few rich people in the States, maybe not that many rich people, not, not that many, let me, let me not over exaggerate. I know a few, a few rich people in the US. And, and the, these rich people that I know, I won't say their names, they're, the, the ones that I know are very godly. And riches doesn't have a bad role in their life. They're not focused on riches. But there's also a bunch of people in the US and here in the Philippines around the world who have riches and they're focused on riches and it, it just bankrupts their, their spiritual and moral life. And so we see the identity of Jesus. He's the amen. All truth comes from him. He is the faithful and true witness. He speaks what is true and what is faithful in our lives. And he's also the origin of the creation of God. So when it comes to materialism, we should heed his voice on what he says about what our focus should be in our lives. And so let's listen to what he says, the church of Laodicea, a church that was filled with material possessions. Let's read again verses 15 through 16. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Agui. That's hard. That's a hard saying. Now, he, he, this is in relation to their works. Now, normally with most of the churches, he says something positive first about them, right? He says, oh, I know your works, your love, your faithfulness, you're doing great, and this and this, but this I have against you, right? Normally, he says it that way, except for the church uh, in Sardis and here now at this church. He doesn't have anything positive to say because their works are lukewarm, their activity before God, especially as it relates with what the church should be doing, is lukewarm. That's not to say that they're doing nothing, but that their activity is lukewarm. Now, what do we mean by lukewarm? Now, sometimes when, you know, just in general, Christians oftentimes associate cold with what is bad and hot with what is good, right? Usually say, you wanna be hot, burning, on fire, passionate for the Lord. And, and there are some places where maybe the Bible uses that imagery, although this isn't the case here. Cold isn't bad and hot isn't good. Both cold and hot are good. Now you have to understand it within the context of Laodicea and their physical situation. They were in a city that didn't have a natural water supply. And so they had to pipe in, which actually is another sign of their, their wealth. They, had to, they created this whole piping system, and they even had water pressure. I was reading about it in a Bible dictionary. They even had some kind of water pressure there in Laodicea that they've been able to find through archaeology where they had the water go up and then had a pressure, how it had, would give pressure because it was up, and then would provide for the public baths and things like that. So pretty amazing, their wealth but they had to pipe it in from six miles away. That's probably like eight or nine kilometers away. That's pretty far. That's pretty far to bring in water. 
And so after the water would get to them, they piped it in from a place that was a natural hot spring. After the water would get to them, it's already lukewarm. You can imagine you take hot water and you let it sit out for a while. It becomes kind of lukewarm. It's like, oh, you know, it's not hot and therapeutic. Like if you're going to have a nice tea and you have a hot tea and like, hmm, so therapeutic. But if you let it sit there for a while, it gets lukewarm and it's like, oh, it doesn't taste good anymore. The same is true for cold water, a little bit a ways away, kind of in the same valley geographically, there's the city of Colossae. The city of Colossae had nice natural cold springs. Cold springs are nice and refreshing, especially when it's hot. We know that right now, it's very hot right now. What's it like to get a nice cold drink of water? Oh, it's so refreshing. By the way, I've seen posts going around on the internet where uh, it says if you drink cold water and it's really hot and you're really hot, that it'll burst your blood vessels. That's not true, that's, that's fake news. I don't know who invented that, but that's fake news. I can send an article out. If you guys saw that on Facebook, I can send you an, an article. That's not true. You can drink all the cold water you want and you will not uh, have your blood vessels burst, at least not from the change of cold to, to hot. Uh, some people actually have an issue, very, very rare, with cold water in general. Even if they were already cold, they would have an issue with cold water. But, but that's not the case if you have hot water or whatever. So cold water, very refreshing. All that to say, cold water is very refreshing. And on a hot day, it just makes all the difference in the world. You go in, you get a nice cold cup of water, and you feel the cold filtering through you. And you're like, ah, oh, oh, oh. yeah, so nice. Or on a nice cold day, which we don't have too many cold days here. They did there. Oh, a cup of hot water. Ah, oh, that would be so, that's so nice. A cup of hot tea when it's cold. Jay, of course, of course and Carmela know that. <laughs> in the States, they're from Chicago, which I don't think I would survive in because it'd probably like freeze the moment I walked outside. Hot water is therapeutic. Cold water is refreshing, but lukewarm is useless. Sometimes if you, uh, you know, accidentally get the, you know, the warm water and you're about to drink it, you'd rather pour it out than drink it. And that's how the Lord feels about Laodicea's spiritual life. Of course, he's not talking about actually them being cold or hot physically. He's talking about them being spiritually not refreshing, not therapeutic in their ministry before the Lord, in their works. It's not refreshing works. It's not therapeutic works. It's just blah. Their spiritual life before the Lord is nauseating. And as we'll see as we go along, it's because they're not investing in their spiritual life. And when you don't invest in your spiritual life, then whatever comes out of you will just be bland. It'll just be blah. It'll just be nauseating. And I know probably all of us have had a time in our, in our time of ministry, if you've been in ministry for any length of time, where we start to, or we, we, where we, we, we stop investing as much in our spiritual life, and then what happens? Well, of course, our relationship with the Lord is affected. We're not in love with the Lord as we should. And then, of course, everything that we're doing for the Lord becomes just a chore. And so the rebuke for the Laodiceans is that they are spiritually useless. They are spiritually useless. And of course, this comes from their focus, as we'll see in a second, upon physical wealth and not spiritual wealth. And so let's continue on reading verses 17 through 20. Verses 17 through 20, it says, Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, blind, a poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. 
As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Let's go back to verse 17. Now the Lord repeats what they have said of themselves and uses that as the reason or the, the reason why uh, for the Lord's command. The Lord's going to give a command in verse 18 and the reason why he needs to give it to them is because of what they say about themselves that he repeats in verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Sad to say, sometimes our focus in this life is purely on material things. We think as long as we can get a good enough job, as long as we can get uh, enough in the bank account, as long as we can get enough material possessions, then we'll be fine in our life. And as I mentioned before, the, La the city of Laodicea, including the Christians, was very wealthy. They even had enough, which this, uh, the, the, that earthquake that I mentioned in 60 AD was probably a good two to three decades prior to this letter being written, if not more. Uh, but they had just had enough to rebuild their city completely. And now they're still considered a very, very wealthy city even still. I can't imagine how wealthy they actually were. But they are wealthy enough to say, I have need of nothing. There's nothing that you can give me. It's my birthday. What do you need? You know, it's your birthday. What do you need? Oh, I don't need anything. I've got everything I need. And that yet they don't realize that in their focus on material things, their spiritual life has withered away into nothing. And so they say, I'm rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. I pray that we wouldn't get so focused on material things that we would think that that will be what is necessary to satisfy our lives in all aspects. That's, you know, the, kind of the American dream. And a lot of people will go abroad to the U.S. or even to Canada or other places like that because they think just as long as I can get enough wealth, I'll be fine. There's things that money can't buy. <laughs> It's hard to, uh, you know, impress this enough, but there are, so, there, there are a multitude of things that money cannot buy. And one of those things is spiritual health, or spiritual wealth, but spiritual health, really. Look at the second part of verse 17. This is what they said in first part of verse 17. And do not know, you say this, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What a way to describe somebody. Those first two are a little bit interchangeable, wretched, miserable. The first one can be uh, also translated as miserable. The second one, which is translated as miserable, the Greek word can be translated as pitiful. Poor, blind, and naked. Think of the worst situation you've ever seen someone in. I, I can remember going to Mexico one time. I don't know, maybe, Ed, maybe you were on that trip. I can't remember. <laughs> but uh, going to Mexico one time in 2014, right before we came back to the Philippines here, and we went down, and I, I, could, I don't even remember exactly where it was because I'm so confused in Mexico. Everything's <laughs> in Spanish, and I'm just, I'm just in the car. I'm just going for the ride, doing the ministry and whatnot. But we went down to this place, and it, was, it looked like we're just going out to the desert. But it was a gigantic trash dump in the middle of the desert, and there were people living on this trash dump in the middle of the desert. Now, for those of you who don't have an idea of the, the, the you know, weather situation, the climate there, in wintertime, it's very, very cold. In summertime, it's very, very hot. If, you know, one of those people would come here, they would say, wow, this is nice weather, you know. Uh, it's very, very hot there in Mexico, especially when you're getting out into the desert. And as we walked out there, we parked and we walked out to this place. We're walking by people that are living under blankets that are set up like tents with sticks and things that they've found in the trash dump. Now, some people were lucky enough to have had some people come in and build like small shelters for them. The shelters were maybe not even half the size of this room. 
And there was one lady we walked by. I don't know. Maybe you were. I don't know if you were on this trip, Ed. Maybe you were. Uh, maybe you were already here in the Philippines that time. I'm not sure. But there was one structure we walked by, and it was a lady who was trying to build a little shelter with, you know, the pallets that go under like a shipping a shipment. They have a shipment with a pallet. And the wood, she was just stacking those up and putting them together. And so we're like, well, we're, we're here. And so we he said, how can we help you? So we're just, we didn't have any tools, just, you know, finding some wire here and tying up the wall. And <sighs> what a life. We walked by this one guy who was burning a bunch of keyboards to get the metal out from them. And we asked, you know, how much he, he makes per day. I just, very, very, very little. And then just to get water is like a whole day's wage just to get water. So they work for five days, six days, seven days, probably seven days. And one of those days is completely gone because they pay for that just for water. For one gallon of water is a whole day's wage for them. For me, I was like, wow, this is <laughs> one of the worst places. I've been to some pretty bad places. Also, you know, you could say here in the Philippines, Balut Tondo up in Manila with Smoky Mountain. The, before, especially, it's, it's very bad. I'm not sure about nowadays with the, the people living on the trash dump there in Smoky Mountain. Think of the worst situation you could think of of a, of a person living in object poverty, completely destitute. The Lord looked at the Laodicean church and he said, you may be rich physically, but spiritually you are absolutely, completely destitute. You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and you are naked spiritually. They had all the physical things in the world that they could want, and yet spiritually they were bankrupt. And so what does the Lord counsel them to do in verse 18? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Now, all of these have a picture that relates with their physical situation. The gold obviously relates with their wealth. They had physical wealth, but not spiritual wealth. The white garments obviously relates to the fact that they were a clothing producer. They, they produced textiles, clothing, you know, shirts, pants, whatever. I'm not sure exactly what they produced, but they produced clothing there at that city. It was one of the ways they gained their wealth. And also they had a uh, medicine producing thing there. I don't know if you could call it a hospital like we call it or a pharmacy like we call it, but they produced medicine there in Laodicea. And a lot of scholars think that maybe one of the things that they produced possibly was a type of eye ointment that they would put on their eyes. Of course, it'd be very expensive to buy, but they had all these things there at their fingertips. And the Lord is saying, you need those things spiritually. Now, you might be able to say each one of these has a different meaning. It, it, it could. You could say maybe that the idea of gold is regarding their faith. Uh, just as our faith is refined in the fire and comes out like gold, you could say the clothing maybe refers to living righteously. You could say maybe the eyes refers to us having spiritual discernment and seeing things spiritually. That's possibly, that's, uh, that's possibly true. Or it could be just that the Lord is referencing all the things that they have in their life and saying you're focused on investing in your financial, physical financial situation but you're not focused at all on investing in your spiritual situation. Let me ask you a question. How do we invest in our spiritual life? How do we do that? Can we buy spiritual wealth with physical money? Can we buy, can we buy physical or spiritual health with, or can we make ourselves spiritually healthy through physical medicine? <laughs> How do we get spiritually healthy? Bible. Oh, yeah, there you go. It's not a trick question. You know, the Bible, right? It's the Word of God. It's the Bible. Is that the Carmel is pointing at her Bible? It's the Bible. Spending time with God in His Word, in prayer, in really all the spiritual disciplines, worship, fellowship with other believers, these things that produce in us spiritual benefit. 
if we're not doing these things, but doing just the other things that produce physical wealth, then our lives will become spiritually bankrupt. Now again, I, I don't want you guys to get, get the misunderstanding that I'm against people who are wealthy or something like that. I, wealth is nothing by itself. It's not that, you know, if you have money, you're good, or if you don't have money, you're not, you know, you're, you know, sometimes like in the Old Testament, they would say, oh, if you're wealthy, it's a sign of your godliness, but if you're poor, it's a sign of your wickedness. Well, I mean, it could be a sign of laziness. That's possible. That's another possibility. But just wealth itself doesn't mean anything. You could have it and be a godly person, or you could have it and be completely spiritually bankrupt. The important thing is to ask, how am I investing in my spiritual life? Am I investing in my spiritual life? We might spend a whole lot of time developing a business, you know, and developing a business takes a lot of effort. You got to go through SEC registration, you got to go to the BIR, and you got to, you know, uh, get a business going together, all that. That's such tough stuff to do all those things. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of investment. And you're wealthy, go for it, good job. But it means nothing if you're not taking time to grow your spiritual life. And that's something that all of us have to consider. Even as we're in the ministry, how are we investing in our spiritual life individually? Are we taking that time? Are we making sure that our, our, our relationship with the Lord is good? Are we fellowshipping with one another? You know, I, I can say for myself, I don't fellowship with not, as much as I should. I've been doing some more. Uh, lately, I've been getting together with uh, Pastor Ian for coffee, and I really enjoy that. I enjoy hanging out with somebody who is, you know, a spiritually mature brother and just having him say something to me and me say something to him, you know, talking about the things of the Lord and, and really having that deep, deep fellowship. And I, I, you know, that's one of the biggest areas in my life that I struggle with having that good deep fellowship? Are we having biblical strong fellowship with one another? Are we in the Word of God? We're studying the Word of God. Are we in it devotionally? Are we praying, spending time with the Lord? Are we, are we worshiping the Lord through songs and through our life? We need to invest in our lives spiritually. Otherwise, spiritually, we will become wretched, miserable, blind, poor, and naked. Now, I, I'm not accusing anyone here of being that right now. I have no idea. Jesus knows each and every one of our hearts, and he knows our spiritual situation. But if that's not our current situation, it's something that we can be warned to stay away from. That riches, seeking riches by itself will never satisfy you and in fact will spiritually bankrupt you. So if you want to, if God is calling you to make more money in this area, in this area, great, go for it. Don't neglect your spiritual life because that will ruin your entire life. In verse 19, Jesus encourages them a little bit as part of this command and a secondary command with encouragement. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. So does he still love the Laodiceans? Yes, because he's rebuking them. He's chastening them. He, he, don't, he doesn't rebuke those he doesn't love. If you're not his child, he's not going to rebuke you. But if you're his child, he's going to say, hey, knock it off. You need to not do this. I don't rebuke. I don't, you know, discipline other kids. <laughs> I see bad kids all the time here at the grocery store and whatnot. I see bad kids all the time. I don't go up and discipline those kids. I'm not their parent. I'm like, man, what kind of a kid is that? You know? But when I see my kids doing bad stuff, you better believe I'm going to discipline them. Maybe, uh, you know, uh, depending on the, the severity of the issue, I might uh, send them for a timeout and, you know, go face the wall, you know, spend some time thinking about what they've done and come back and apologize. Or maybe I'm going to spank them. It's a, it's a really, very, very severe thing. Or maybe I'm going to restrict their time on various things that they like or have them have time out in their room. You know, different ways to discipline. I'm not going to discipline someone who's not my kid, though. The Lord loves the Laodiceans. And maybe you're in that, that same state or close to that state where you realize my spiritual life is emptier than it was before or emptier than it should be. The Lord loves you. The Lord loves us. 
And he wants us to go back to that place where we're investing in our spiritual life. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent because you know that you're displeasing God in your actions and you know that God still loves you and wants you to come back into a right relationship with Him. And so be zealous and repent. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now normally we use this, a lot of people use this verse in evangelism. And while it's also true that when we receive forgiveness that the Lord comes into our hearts, yet this isn't spoken to unbelievers. This is spoken to believers. The sad thing about the Laodicean church is that they're all, yeah, not physical church, right, obviously, but as far as the group of believers being the church, Jesus is not in the midst of them. They have church, but it's not really a church. Jesus isn't there. They're not thinking about Jesus. They're not trying to figure out what the best thing they should be doing from the Lord is. They're not being led by the Lord. The Lord has no involvement in this church. Sad to say. Now, again, that's not to say that they're not saved or something like that. But Jesus isn't there. He's like, guys, hey, I'm out here. You forgot to include me. You know, that's something that I'm always... Um, uh, concerned about here at the Bible College that we would do something and the Lord wouldn't be in it and we're all off here doing this thing over here and the Lord's like uh, guys guys uh, I'm over here you know I'm over here I'm doing this over here because you know I know that as much as the Lord has used us in the past here at the Bible College and all of that if we would go away from his will and his plan he will stop using us the question is, are we letting Jesus in to our plans? <laughs> are we saying, Lord, these are, this is the thing that we're thinking in our life, but Lord, what do you want us to do? Is Jesus with us in the middle of us, in the midst of us, leading us, guiding us as the head of the church, which he truly is? Or is he outside knocking like eyes? Hey! Hey guys, let me in. I'm out here. And that's something for each and every one of us to consider personally and corporately as the church to say, is our corporate life as a ministry, is the Lord in the midst of us guiding and leading us or have we left him outside? Now, even if it's the, the case that we are being guided by the Lord, and I believe we are, and I always seek to, you know, even every morning in the prayer time, I always ask the guys to pray for me, that I'll have the wisdom from the Lord to, to know what the next thing is, to do the next thing rightly, whatever it may be. It's something to always be aware of so that we don't come to a place or a time where the Lord's not in our presence, not leading us, not guiding us. He's outside. So let's always be aware of that. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. He wants fellowship with us. He wants to be with us and fellowship with us in our midst so that he can give us an abundant spiritual life. I pray that we would indeed hear his voice, open the door, let him come in, and give us an abundant spiritual life. Now what's the encouragement at the end? Verses 22, 21 through 22. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So what's the encouragement? Sit on the father's throne. Now, I don't know that this is uh, literal, that when you get to heaven, we're all going to be sitting on the throne at the same time, unless the throne is really big or unless physics works differently in heaven, which it probably does, but, but I don't know exactly. I think it's figuratively speaking about that we will partake in God's rule over the earth, which we know that from the church in previous churches, previous messages, especially the church of Thyatira, the Lord promised that they would rule and reign with Christ over the earth, and that's for all believers, during the millennial reign. 
that's part of our spiritual heritage that we will be ruling and reigning with the Lord, especially during the millennial reign, but then throughout eternity we'll be with Him. Now think of all the things that you might want to achieve in your life through physical means. What are we looking for? What is the, and maybe not us, but what is the world looking for when they focus on materialism? In the U.S., we call it the rat race. Heard about that? Well, of course, yeah, <laughs> you're from the States, of course. <laughs> we call it the rat race. Trying to get on top, and you're like racing, racing, racing to get to the biggest prize and become the top dog at some company, become the CEO, something like that. Become, you know, uh, well, what's that guy's name who owns SM? C. Henry C. Henry C. Henry C. C. Is it called C? Henry C. I always used to call it C. I don't know. Henry C. Right, to become the, hint, the next Henry C. who owns all these whatever. That's the way the world looks at it. But you know what we will gain someday? We will be ruling with Jesus Christ from his throne over all things. So what if we don't become the top dog now? Who cares? So what if we don't become the CEO now? Who cares? Someday we'll be ruling and reigning with Christ if we're faithful to Him. And that's why we invest in our spiritual life above investing in our physical life. You know, I, I'm reading my kids, and I know I'll finish up quickly because I know it's practically, we're, we're over time a little bit, but I'm reading my kids a story about a missionary couple who went to Irinjira. It's called Peace Child. And this one chapter we were reading about they, when they started to live in this swamp, they had to find a little knoll that was like three or four feet higher than the rest of the land because if they didn't, then their house would be underwater. <laughs> or at least they would be walking on water if they got out of their house. They built their house on stilts to be up a little bit. And, you know, they try and have mosquito netting, whatnot, but during the, the swampy season, when all the bugs are out, you know, the mosquitoes at first wouldn't be able to get in, but then the rats would chew through the netting to get to their supplies, and then the mosquitoes would come in, and they'd just living out in the middle of nowhere. There's no running water. There's no electricity. They've got a little oil lamp that they've got. And they're, and they're in the midst of three tribes had come together to be with them because, of course, they were trading things like metal machetes and all these tribal people who were Stone Age tribal people wanted these metal machetes and things like that. And so they were all gathered around them, three enemy tribes. And so they said in the first four months, there was, uh, in the first uh, two to four months, I can't remember exactly what they said, but there was 14 battles between these three tribes right on their front lawn, so to speak. <laughs> Can you imagine living that kind of life where you're in the midst of danger all the time and the, the man and his wife and they had a one-year-old baby when they went out there. Can you imagine living that way? I haven't gotten to the end of the story with my kids, but I've read it before so I know the end of the story. And the end of the story is all those tribal people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Some would say if they looked at their life, they would say that life is not a life worth living. Look at all you're suffering through. You don't have material. Actually, they did have support, but what are you going to buy in the middle of the jungle that's actually going to make you have a better life? <laughs> they didn't have the material kind of life that we so often look for. And yet the Lord blessed them spiritually so abundantly. What is our focus on? Again, having material wealth is not, it's not the issue. The question is, where are you investing your life? Physically, in materialism, or are you investing your life in what is spiritually going to produce spiritual wealth in your life? And so the Lord's encouragement to us today, as we read the church in Laodicea, as we look about at them, is invest in your spiritual life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.